All right, I think it's time to get going again. I'm sure we'll have people coming back, but um, this is what happened when I mute notifications, they don't actually mute. So uh, this lesson is going to be about, oh yes, thank you, starting video. So uh, this lesson is going to be about reproducibility and the relationship with better software practices. And um, first of all, I wanna start with uh, a bit about terminology. So a lot of different terms get applied when we're talking about these kinds of things, reproducibility, replicability, reliability, correctness, accuracy, things like that. They don't all mean exactly the same thing, but for purposes of this presentation, um, it, that doesn't really matter. So we're gonna sort of treat this all as one concept. Um, <clears throat> but I did wanna say one thing uh, with respect to the terminology. There's, there are two specific terms that get thrown around a lot reproducible versus replicable. And just to let you know that um, there have been kind of two different competing uh, versions of these two terms, definitions of these two terms running around for a while. Um, and the community has actually made a conscious effort to get together and um, standardize on a, a set of, agree on a set of definitions. And so the, the Work the, the idea that com, comes out of that is that reproducibility is that another team is able to obtain the same results using the author's experimental environment and replicable means that another team is able to obtain consistent results using a different experimental environment. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because you'll see this transition taking place in some places in the literature and things like that. So just be aware. But really, I wanna start out with talking about why reproducibility is important. <clears throat> We've all seen in um, really mass media venues like the New York Times, um, things that bring call, call science results into question. This is an article from 2015 in the New York Times um, about an effort to reproduce a bunch of uh, psychology experiments uh, and finding that they were very hard to reproduce. Um, these kinds of things, especially in this day and age, um, make it easy to call scientific results into question, whether or not they're really questionable on an individual basis. And uh, so this is really kind of one of the high level motivations why um, you know, scientific credibility is important and reproducibility. But it also comes uh, you know, at a deeper level to our individual science. This is an example that comes from the physics or chemistry world. Uh, looking at the behavior of water just above the nucleation temperature. And there were two studies, uh, one done in 2009 that um, found two possible phases for this situation, either a high density phase or a low density phase. Uh, and then there was another study that came along in 2011 saying, no, nah, there's only one phase, just the high density phase. And um, so obviously there's a scientific difference here and how can we resolve this? This is all computationally based. And um, so, you know, the, the second study, the Chandler study said in their paper, you know, the um, LAMPS codes, the uh, molecular dynamics codes used in this work are standard and documented and the scripts are freely available upon request. So the authors of the original study uh, that was got um, different results said, please send us your code. Uh, and that didn't happen for a long, long time. Only after De Benedetti, the first author, uh, appealed to the editor of Nature, actually, the, where it was published, to uh, intervene. And so uh, in the end, the authors of the first study located a bug in the code that the second study was using. It was really, it was intended to speed up LAMP's execution, but it, it actually unintentionally introduced a bug. When they replaced it with a more standard results, they were able to reproduce the original results. But unfortunately, the resolution of this took seven years. Um, and, you know, the, so the, the, um, 
Berkeley paper, the 2011 paper, really wasn't reproducible because they didn't document well enough what they were doing. They said, oh, this is just a minor change. We're not even going to bother documenting it. And um, they just went on. And then they weren't responsive to the, their state statement that uh, they would make the code available. So, um, so this is an example of how it can affect individual science and, and kind of blow up and take a long time to resolve. Uh, there's another recent, more recent example that you might have heard about. This is from uh, 2019. Some folks, uh, there's a large community of folks who use uh, this, you know, there's a widely used Python tool to analyze some nuclear magnetic resonance imaging data. And it turns out that uh, in Python, the glob module, which lists file names uh, matching a pattern, um, that module returned results in a different order, depending on what platform you were running on, and that the results of the script depended on the order in which the files were processed. So finding this error in the script cast into doubt about 150 papers that were just using the script. It was just out there, widely known, uh, and they were using it. Um, and, and so this is another challenge of reproducibility. And, and my question about this is, would a unit te test have caught this? The only way you would have taught, caught this is if you were actually comparing on different platforms and looking for differences like this. Um, so this is, this is challenging, and it's also an indication of um, how you have to sort of think creatively about your testing sometimes to try to catch different kinds of errors. But we go back really fundamentally to this uh, point that I made in the uh, overview presentation, that science through computing is at best as credible as the software that produces it. So we want to worry about the credibility of the software. And we're starting to get more and more reasons to, um, to, to pay attention to reproducibility. We've all heard or even made a statement like, I'd love to do a better job on my software, but I need to get this paper submitted, or I need to do something that my employer values more, or I need to um, complete this other task. And um, what we need to do here is to change the incentives to value the better software to help promote the better science that results. And these kinds of things are happening here and there in different ways. So first of all, <clears throat> When you think about running on a supercomputer, I talked about supercomputing allocations being valuable and uh, scarce resources. And really, no one I know wants to spend their precious allocations running simulations two or three times to be confident of the results. You know, running it and then running it again to make sure you get the same thing and running it again, maybe if those two were different. Um, this happened, you know, I've, anecdotally, I've talked to a lot of people, and this happens more than most people will admit. Uh, and the problem with this is it could still be wrong. If you're just, you know, doing a couple runs and comparing answers, there still may be mistakes in the code. Um, all that's turning up is, uh, uh, you know, sort of silent data corruption errors. But there are a lot of people who need to have confidence in your results. Of course, you do, uh, your boss, your sponsor, the reviewers of your papers, the readers of your papers. Uh, and you need to think about how to build credibility for your code for all these people without having to repeat very expensive runs. And there are definitely ways that you can do that. Another way that folks are, the community is ratcheting up uh, focus on reproducibility is various initiatives. So if you submitted a grant proposal in the United States to the National Science Foundation or the DOE, Department of Energy, you have to have a data management plan as part of your research proposal. You have to say how you're going to deal with the data. And um, that means uh, uh, both uh, sort of the curation and the availability of the data. Um, there's also fair data principles for reuse of research data. And there's a related emerging idea of fair for research software. I'll get about, I'll talk about what fair means in a minute. Uh, and there are also re reproducibility initiatives in publications. We'll, we'll talk about these kind of things. So data management plans basically um, <clears throat> expect you to promptly publish your data to share it, make it available, the underlying data, not just the, here's the graph, but here's the data that went into the graph in a form that other people can use it um, and, and things like that. Fair data principles, fair is findability, accessibility, 
interoperability and reusability. These are also used to help promote the, the concepts that are needed to make data uh, more accessible and more usable to others so that the, the data that we're collecting often with public funding is, is actually um, exposed and not just exposed, but usable to, to others who might want to build on it. Uh, publications, as I mentioned, the uh, Association for Computing Machinery publishes a fair number of journals. One is called Transactions on Mat Mathematical Software, or uh, TOMS. They have a reproducible computational results initiative. This actually involves an extra reviewer. So you have the typical review for the you know, scientific merit and quality. And then there's an additional reviewer assigned specifically to reproduce uh, the work. And um, so they actually write up an adjunct about the reproduction of the work. Um, and so, so they get uh, sort of a publication out of it. Um, your paper, if you go through this process, gets a badge in the journal. So it says it's more reproducible. Um, and you get you know, the extra credibility that, that goes with having that badge. So these are initiatives. Supercomputing is another example. I should have looked up what ISC is doing. I, I don't remember that. Um, but they're essentially now requiring a certain level of uh, reproducibility related uh, extra appendices to any paper that's submitted. So you have to do this artifact description for any paper that's submitted since uh, this has been true since SC19. A lot of this level of information can be generated automatically when they, they have a tool with the submission form that helps do that. Um, and they're um, evaluated by reviewers for accepted papers. And then there's another level called artifact evaluation that targets sort of more boutique environments like high-end supercomputers and things like that. And this is this is optional, but these, these requirements are being ratcheted up a few years ago, even the AD Artifact description was optional, now it's mandatory, et cetera, et cetera. So these are kind of slowly working their way up. Uh, and there are a number of these other conferences have uh, similar kinds of ideas about reproducibility. And then there's this, uh, the last line here is this uh, organization uh, at large, it's a standards organization actually that's looking at reproducibility and badging. It's got a lot of publishers involved uh, in how to make, how to set common standards across publications for this kind of badging. So we see a lot of various efforts taking place within the community to try to insist on um, more, um, better transparency and reproducibility and really the mechanisms to pursue that for us involve the same mechanisms to a very large extent that give us the productivity and sustainability. And so these, this is really creating a virtuous cycle. Um, and so basically we wanna focus on good software development practices and then to go with that good experimental practices when you're doing your numerical experiments that constitute your science. So how do we go about re improving reproducibility? So there are different phases of your work and I'm gonna go through each of them. There's a lot of content here. I'm not necessarily gonna go into detail on most of this, but you can go back and review this and you're also welcome to ask questions. We can focus on particular things if you, uh, if you want to. So first of all, during development, one thing to think about is solid versioning practices. And this goes back to what I may have been Alexander asked in the chat earlier, right? So you wanna make sure um, that you have all of your code, documentation, and other artifacts under version control, and you wanna do frequent commits so that you have, you are consistently capturing anything that um, is important to the evolution of the project so that you have a history, a complete history. Second of all, provide versioning information for key outputs. Your code can output a version number, or you can use the git, git hash or things like that. And then maintaining uh, documentation and other artifacts in sync with your code. Um, if you don't do this when you're writing the code or when you're changing the code, you're gonna update it and you're gonna say, I don't have time to go back and do this. It's less important, but it's really not. It's uh, important essentially for your future self for the reproducibility of your software to, to document it before you forget. 
Also, you want to build in quality from the start during your development practices. So you, we encourage you to define and follow coding standards to develop tests as you go, not just add them as an afterthought. Um, you should think about increasingly rigorous testing regimes as your code becomes more and more public. So if you're do, just doing something for yourself to prototype ideas or things like that, um, maybe it doesn't have to be as rigorously tested. Uh, but if you're, you have a, a, a large code that a lot of people are using, then that gets a different level of scrutiny and you have more people relying on the code um, and, and things like that. So you want to think about different um, levels of rigor and you want to think about um, setting up those tests. Uh, tests will have different levels of cost and so some things you can do in a continuous integration setting. Other things you might want to do, you know, nightly or once a week or something like that. Performance tests, maybe you can wait longer to make sure you don't have severe performance regressions. And we'll talk more about testing strategies uh, tomorrow. Also, another practice we've mentioned is uh, peer code review. This means that um, you get others to look over your commit and make sure it looks correct and it's understood by them. Um, there's a lot of benefits to this practice. It gives more people an understanding of more of the code. It's also a way to help people get on board um, so that you have less experienced uh, coders getting input from more experienced coders. Um, and you can do this, you know, if you have a lot of existing code that hasn't been reviewed, you can try to, you should try to do it going forward, but you can also build a kind of a retrospective aspect to say, you know, every week I'm going to do one more module of, of unreviewed old code. Um, and then after development, you want to keep on testing and adding more tests. So anytime you have a bug, add a regression test for it to make sure that bug doesn't keep creep back in. Um, you can, there's always more tests that you can add, you should be creative. Think about the common cases, think about the corner cases, think about misuse of routines, whether it's intentional or unintentional. Um, it's very useful from the physics standpoint to think about synthetic tests with synthetic data. They may not be real physics, but oftentimes that is the best way to exercise some of the routines that you're producing. If you can construct a data set uh, and process it in your routine and you know what that result should look like um, unambiguously, um, that makes a good test. You should also think about low cost tests that can be always on. So, you know, some things, a lot of things may be too expensive to always enable when you're in a production run, but, you know, uh, these big production runs, especially at the scale that you've never done them before, um, are, you know, you're producing new results, it becomes harder to see if those results are really valid to be confident in that. So if you can institute some simple tests that don't take a lot of time um, and that can help you have confidence that you're not uh, getting silent data corruption in your code, uh, that can be very valuable. Test your tests, make sure that your tests actually fail when they're supposed to. Uh, thoroughly verify the code. Does the code do what you intended it to do on all the platforms of interest? So it's really useful to, to look across different compilers and different hardware platforms because they tend to have different characteristics and will reveal different types of errors that you may not otherwise catch. And then test regularly because it's not only your code, even if your code is not changing, typically the, heart, the uh, software environment underneath that the facility installs or whatever will change periodically. So you wanna make sure you catch that. If a library changes and suddenly the results of your code change, whoa, you need to know, okay? So a little bit of a digression here. Um, some test uh, uh, physics or math-based testing strategies. Use what you know or can construct about the model you're studying to test its implementation. So I talked on the previous slide about synthetic data or synthetic problems, synthetic operators, where you can construct them with certain properties. Oftentimes in physics, you'll have invariance principles or conservation rules or things like that that you can exploit. They make very good tests. Some of them can be implemented very easily with low cost and you can always apply them. Another digression, 
is designed by contract programming. This is a concept of building testing into your routines. It's meant to complement, not replace other testing. Uh, but this is uh, really about the caller callee relationship. So what does your routine expect on input? What does your routine guarantee at completion? And what does your routine leave unchanged? These are known as preconditions, postconditions, and invariants. So basically the contract is that given valid inputs, the preconditions are satisfied, a routine should guarantee valid outputs, which means the post conditions are satisfied and the invariants are maintained. So this is a form of testing that says, okay, I'm gonna make sure that the inputs that I've been handed are reasonable, that I can work properly with them. And then I'm going to ensure in the construction of my code and perhaps additional testing that I'm providing correct, consistent results, okay? Um, making that contract explicit really facilitates the correct use of routines. And this is especially useful if you have this kind of separation that Anju has talked about, where, for example, the infrastructure may be developed by different people who are then are working on the model. The folks developing the model need to call the infrastructure code, but they may not have a deep knowledge. So if the infrastructure code clearly exposes the contract, at a, at a level of each routine, then you're safer in using it. Okay, so now we move on to doing your numerical experiments. So first of all is some planning, thinking about what are you going to do, how are you going to do it, why you're going to do it. So plan your experiments thoroughly. Uh, it's useful if you're in a team to designate one person to coordinate the whole experimental campaign so that there is somebody who knows, uh, really has the responsibility of knowing everything that's going on and ensuring that it's all dealt with properly. You need to understand what you need as inputs, what you're going to get as outputs uh, that you need to capture and analyze for your science. Um, how are you gonna process those results? You should plan ahead for that to make sure you have the ability to do that. Um, you should know what to expect. Roughly, what are the results going to look like? How long are they going to take? Uh, you know, what scale are they gonna run at? And then how will you convince yourselves that the results you're getting are trustworthy, especially if you're doing uh, simulations at a scale or in a type of problem that you've never done before. That's how we do new science, but that's also the danger zone for most of our codes because we're getting into new territory. So how can you convince yourself um, that, that you're getting good results? It's useful to perform sort of test runs or pilot runs, uh, scaling up or building up in an incremental way to make sure that the code is, you know, to help gain confidence essentially in the code that it will do what you need at the scales of your full runs. And then ensure that you have the resources to store and to analyze the outputs. It's really uh, a bummer if you do all these big runs and you generate a few petabytes of data and then the facility comes along and says, oh, our storage is full. We're gonna purge everything that's over 30 days old. Um, and you did that, uh, you know, you did those runs six weeks ago and you haven't had time to process them yet. That's, you know, have to understand things like that too. Uh, can you reproduce the code that you're using for each and every experiment? And can you re reuse it, uh, reproduce it three years later, for example? So uh, this gets back to the version control. Make sure you use only well-defined versions of your code. So uh, don't just pick whatever's in your local copy while you're being while you're developing it, but making sure that you're using uh, essentially an official use or something, uh, an official release or something that's tagged, something like that. So you can go back and say, this is what I used for these runs. Um, and make sure that the versions you're using have been thoroughly verified, especially if you're doing development work uh, and continue the regular testing. As I said, the platform can change out for under you, from under you. So even if you're doing, you know, if you have a long series of runs, you're taking a month or two months to do a, a series of runs, even if the code, your code stays fixed, it's quite possible that some of the underlying libraries or things like that will be changed due to system updates. So once again, keep some testing going to make sure that um, everything is, is consistent and then make sure you're capturing all the version information that you can. Um, you can go and do this with some of your key dependencies, your libraries, compilers, and other things. A lot of people don't do this, but it is something that can help you understand and reproduce the environment that you're working in. 
we throw in capturing provenance. Provenance means uh, the agents or the codes that are touching the data, generating the data, the um, inputs and outputs that are involved and what's actually happening, the activities. So once again, capture the code versions, capture all the inputs and the configuration information. Um, and and you, can, you should use multiple systems to mental systems to ensure that you can correctly associate the inputs and outputs and code versions. So if you're, you know, you can have a directory structure that has systematic naming and uh, for the directories and files, you can keep a, a, a written record or an electronic lab notebook that captures this information. You can use scripts to orchestrate your experiments and those scripts should be versioned and they should be captured in your version control. If your data is not too large, especially with inputs or things like that, you can capture the, the, the data itself in the version control system. And you may not want to put it in the same version control system uh, repository where your code is. You may want to have a separate one for your experiments. But be sure to capture whatever you can, inputs, outputs, um, process in multiple forms. So you shouldn't use just naming conventions. You shouldn't use just a lab notebook, just scripts. You should have multiples of those so that when you make a mistake in one, you can go back and cross-reference with other things to uh, reproduce. And finally, after the experiments, uh, you're doing the data analysis and reduction. You need to continue to capture the provenance. One way to help make this more systematic is to script as much of this as you can. So it's uh, useful to have scriptable tools rather than those with a GUI that requires human interaction because you are frankly harder to reproduce. Um, keep them under version control, the scripts under version control. Document your process thoroughly. Uh, capture key intermediates, so don't, you know, don't just take uh, the original data, process it all the way down to the end, but there are probably some intermediate steps that you can look at and capture. You want to look at them to make sure they make sense, and you want to capture them so that you can help reproduce uh, if any questions arise. And then uh, capture this data in machine readable form, uh, even if you're going to use graphs or tables or things like that. Your data management plan probably says you're going to make this data, underlying data, available, and an increasing number of publishers are also expecting this kind of thing. There are some tools out there that can help you with reproducibility. There's a lot of talk these days about containers to capture and encapsulate software. These have advantages and disadvantages, which I don't want to go into here, but we can chat about if you want. There are resources for um, understanding floating point math and uh, the impacts of floating point. That's one of the things I mentioned at the very beginning that makes a real challenge for reproducibility of scientific software in particular. There are also some platforms out there that can help you publish and reproduce your code and your data. They're typically not, um, you know, they're, they're not going to scale out to supercomputer size simulations, but, but there are some situations where they might be useful. And then you can generate uh, persistent identifiers like uh, digital object identifiers, DOIs, for your data, for your code, and other things. So for example, you, have, you can connect um, your GitHub repository with Zenodo so that every time you tag a release, uh, a copy of it gets made in Zenodo and you get a DOI for it. And then you can go back and um, that DOI is persistent and you can go back and make sure that uh, you, you can get a copy of that uh, version of the code at any time. But if you're using any of these tools, it's uh, important to make sure you test and understand your truths thoroughly before you use them for something important. So this goes back to the planning process, for example, for your big runs. Um, if you're going to use some tools, put that into your planning process and make sure that you understand how they work uh, and that they're doing what you need. So to summarize the credibility of your science, derives from the credibility of your code and the process by which you use it. Science stakeholders, publishers, sponsors, others are ratcheting up expectations for reproducibility, but this is manageable. We've talked about strategies to improve reproducibility in all phases of the scientific process. You may not use all of them uh, in every case, but you, you have a lot of ideas here that you can build on to, to help improve your processes. And really, if you think about everything we talked about amounts to better software development practices. They're the same kinds of practices that we advocated for reasons of productivity and sustainability and maintainability. And now 
they apply to reproducibility as well. So it's kind of a one-stop shop in that sense. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll have some links that you can refer to. They're also in the web page, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions.